welcome to my sewing room. We've been having such a good time smocking on the uh, shows up to this point. I thought I'd share with you a little bit today about how to put the pleats in before you do the smocking stitches. This is one of my very favorite dresses that has smocking and silk ribbon embroidery on top of the smocking. By the way, those are very easy baby waves that you've already learned on the show. This is another much fancier version of a smock dress. This is done on silk organza and it has back smocking with some silk ribbon embroidery on top. This is a very, very cute little corduroy school dress which has smocking in black, just a little bit of smocking across the front of the pinafore. Now smocking is not just for little girls, it's for little boys also. This is a very, very tailored and very elegant suit for little boys with very simple geometric smocking. Oh, I could have any of you doing this kind of smocking in probably about a 30 minute class. Another very interesting and good looking tailored outfit for the little older girl has a smocked piece which comes down into a V in the front and it comes all the way to the waist. So this would be very pleasing on your older girls. This style is called a smocked bishop. Can you see it's a little bit of a round yoke on the top? Well, a little bit later on in the show, I'm going to show you how to pleat a bishop, how to pleat a little boy's straight front, how to pleat uh, pieces that go up and down. There's very little, very little difficult about pleating. As a matter of fact, it's so easy, nobody really believes it. So I'm going to share with you just how it is that we put the pleating in before we do the English smocking. Come on over and let's have a lesson. I think you're going to be fascinated to see how easy it is to pleat for English smocking. All right, now watch down here. These are the needles which are in the pleating machine. It's made out of brass and has half spaces all the way across. All right, I'm going to pull up my thread here, come in, and by the way, the eyes of the needles are pretty big, so they're pretty easy to thread. And I'm going to pull it down all about thus far. And you can see I have the little uh, uh, bobbins down here on the bottom. Now we've got all of this threaded up. Let's see, first of all, how you pleat a sleeve. I'm getting ready to smock this sleeve, and as you can see, my little rows of pleats are already in there, and now I'm ready to do my smocking. Let's see what a sleeve would look like before I ran it through the pleater. You see, I marked the line, and then I would run it through the pleater. Now then, I'm going to show you a little bishop dress. Earlier in the show, I showed you that. Here is what the little bishop dress, about a size, oh, 12 months. The pleats go around. And here's what they look like in the back. I'm going to be ready to smock here in a few minutes. But do I have a secret to show you? Guess what that little bishop looked like before I ran it through the pleater. All right, now you just watch. A little magic here. All right, here is the back. Here is one sleeve. Now all of this is going to be run through the pleater. Here is the front, that little line right there is the center front of the dress. Here is another sleeve. And here is the back. That is a very long piece. I roll it on the dowel stick, which I'll show you in just a minute, run it through the pleater, and that is what it looks like, a very small little size, one, probably a 12 months bishop dress. It was that great long piece I showed you just a minute ago. Now then, let's look at this particular style. This is called a yoke style dress. It has a little armhole cut out, and you see the pleats have been run in there. It's all ready to smock. Let me share with you what happens there. First of all, I'm going to get a long piece of fabric, and this is what it looks like after it's been run through the pleater. The armhole curves have been drawn off, and the pleat, pleating lines, the pleating stitching has been run in. Now, I have taken that straight piece of fabric, which will eventually be one of those yoke dresses, and I have put the whole 45 inches, I have rolled it onto the dowel stick. Now. I'm going to slip it in here, and I love this pleater, it has the half spaces all the way across. I'm going to see, I usually do this standing up by the way, I'm going to run it up here and I'm going to guide, I'm going to guide that little top right there on the, wherever I want it to enter the pleater. Now there are two tricks which I'm going to share with you. All I do is just roll it off a little bit at a time. 
Now then let me show you the first trick. Watch this hand real carefully, please. I'm going to pull it in this direction. In other words, it's almost just like grabbing it and pulling it, not really pulling it hard, but this keeps it straight. I'm going to run my hands as I pull it through. Now I'm not going to pull it this way and I'm not going to pull it that way. I'm simply going to run my hands on here to be sure it doesn't kind of goof up at the, at the bottom there. Now let me show you the other trick I'm doing. I'm guiding over here on this point. I'm looking over the pleater and I'm watching to see that it comes in at the top at the right place. And if it gets a little off, I simply come in here and adjust it a little bit. That's the reason it's a little bit easier to do this standing up, but I think I can see it. So they're just two tricks. Now look at here, oh my goodness. I have all this fabric kind of loaded up on the needles. That's what we call loading the needles. There's no point in letting that fabric stay there. I'm just gonna slip it off. So I'll have an, a nice area on the needles for the next amount of fabric to be rolled onto. Do you see those absolutely perfect pleats there? Now let's go ahead and roll it a little bit more. Do you remember what I'm doing over here? I'm simply pulling my hand to keep it from, from wadding up a little bit at the bottom end. And I'm watching, and then I can come in here and adjust this stick just a little bit. I can also adjust back here just a little bit. I'm guiding at the top, kind of looking over the machine to be sure I'm guiding it through straight. Now look here, once again, I have the fabric that is loaded up on the needles, so I'm simply gonna slip the fabric off the needles like this. See those perfect pleats that are in there? By the way, you can also load up half spaces to have more spaces if you would like to. Now I'm gonna go a little bit faster because I usually do this a little bit faster. And I'm gonna unload it down at the end, hold on to it, run it through the pleater. Once again, I have loaded my fabric onto the needles. So I'm going to pull just a little bit. I'm gonna pull it off just a little bit. Perfect pleats every time. And I'm going to go ahead, unwind it off of here, run it all the way through. And now then the front of my dress is pleated. I can slip it off. And with this particular pleater, because we have the bobbins down here at the end, we can start running another row and pleat as much as we want to without re-threading. On many pleaters, you just simply re-thread on each one, each time you start to run it through. And now that is, my pleating looks just like this. I'm ready to push it up now, push it up, and then I'll be ready to start my English smocking. Next, I have a very special guest who has an absolutely beautiful silk ribbon technique for you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, Beverly Sheldrick from New Zealand. Beverly is the author of a wonderful needlework book by the name of Colonial Inspirations. She is also a guest designer very frequently, I might say thank you for, to, for So Beautiful and Fancy Work magazines. Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. Uh, today, Martha, I'm going to do this sign. Now, I think you will agree that there's no excuse for missing this one. Oh, it's just the beautiful. Colors. I love those colors. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun, aren't they? Now, you will see that we have little forget-me-nots here, and this is the stitch that I'm going to be teaching your readers today. Um, also, you will see that I have written the sign. I have used two millimeter ribbon, and I have held it down with just little French knots, holding it there in place. Obviously, Martha, we could use it for a baby pillow or for somebody's name for their room or anything like that. So it's a pretty border which can be used in lots of ways. Now, I'm going to show you how to do these beautiful little forget-me-nots. They take a little care, but I think they're worth the, pro the trouble. You will see I've started with this little loop here. It's not flat on the ground. It's just lying there the second one, and the third. So I'm working my way round, fourth, and then the fifth. And you will see here that I have a little clump. Now they look particularly good, I think, when they're done in clumps. Um, and they look wonderful if you do them in variegated ribbons too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they just look super. Now you will see I've done the first one here, and I'm now going to do the second one 
and I'm just going to pull it through and if you feel that you need a little stick to just help you get that, keep it straight, take it through, there's the little loop. Now come up again, right beside it, not in the same hole ladies, but right beside it, pull it through and once more that little pulling it through and taking it over your stick so that it sits very nicely and tightly like that. You find that the flowers actually hold themselves up, these little petals, because they're so close. And there we have our fourth one. And then finally the fifth one. The distance in the middle is so small that you don't need to put um, a little French knot or anything like that, although if you wish to put a clear crystal, that can look rather pretty because it can look as though you've got just a little uh, raindrop there. And we've pulled that through and there we are, that dear little flower. Now to make the project is really very simple. You will see that I have here I've drawn the design on here and if you have trouble with getting your design on a, a thickish fabric like this, just hold it up to the window and you'll find it much easier to trace it. So there's our design, we've got the writing there. You'll also see that I have piped it and I have pinned these ribbons. You will also notice that I have the ribbon on an angle like this so that when we go to hang it up like this you can see how it just sits very nicely. So we have the two ribbons there. We've then got to put a backing on it and you will find that if you turn it over and use your stitching line for the piping then when you stitch along here you have a guide, it means that your piping then sits very nicely. So right round, um, on, remember also when you're putting your backing on to leave one end clear because we need to be able to put our piece of cardboard through like that. You see I've pulled it through and I'm now going to slip that piece of cardboard in like that and then this will just be turned over, this will be turned in like that and I will then just hand stitch these two together. I like to use a ladder stitch, I think it gives a very nice finish to when you go to stitch these two together and you will see here, you can't see where it's been joined at all. And so there we have a rather charming little sign. Oh, Beverly, and I really love the forget-me-nots. <laughs> they were those fun. Are really, well, they are fun flowers, and I also really like the way that you did your do not disturb in the letters. <laughs> Beverly, thank you so very much. Thank you, Martha. And now I have a very special antique technique for you. This is a really cute little stitch that is on this antique little boy suit. The stitch that I'm going to share with you really is a blanket stitch done by hand, but now you can imagine I'm not going to do it by hand. All right, now you see the little blanket stitch which has been used to attach this little scalloped edge that goes around here, and the cute little dog embroidery over there with outline stitch. The blanket stitch has been used once again on the sleeve. See the little blanket stitch that's been used where the cuff is attached to the sleeve? Now, I'm going to share with you an easy way to do this blanket stitch. There are several ways to use a blanket stitch for decorative purposes. The first one I'm going to share with you is simply to use the blanket stitch to hem. See how pretty that is? And by the way, I told you the blanket stitch. I'm really going to also use a Madeira applique stitch or a pin stitch on the machine as it's also called. Now the way you do this and make it really easy is simply to put water soluble stabilizer behind the stitching and this is done on a starched piece of Swiss Batiste. 
Now the collar, which is very similar to the collar on the little antique boy suit over here, is lined. And then I have done the pin stitch or Madeira applique stitch around this portion of the collar. Now can you see that this portion of the collar is not quite so heavily stitched? That is a true blanket stitch. The Madeira applique stitch goes over the one more, over, over, over one more time and it's a little bit heavier. Once again, it has been stitched on water soluble stabilizer. There is another really, really wonderful way to use this decorative blanket stitch and it is to use it on the bottom to hem with. Once again, let me try to point out, this is the Madeira applique or the pin stitch which is heavier because it goes over it twice rather than just once. And then this is a machine blanket stitch on this side which isn't so heavy. And then I've simply straight stitched to put the hem in. Let's go over here and see how this pin stitch or Madeira applique stitch looks. All right, by the way, some people also call it the Point de Paris stitch. All right, now that I'm going to stitch and I have my water soluble stabilizer underneath this lined collar and I'm going to simply stitch around. Here we go around the curve and the water soluble stabilizer gives me plenty of stability since this is a little batiste collar, but by the way, it has been lined and starched and pressed. Now then the outside, the stitches that, goes, that go back and forth are right on the very edge of the collar, and I mean the very edge, almost on the outside. And then the little part that catches it goes in, of course, across the collar. Now this is the pin stitch, the Madeira applique or the Point de Paris stitch, and I am not using a wing needle. Many times when I do this stitch on heirloom sewing, I use a wing needle and it really is beautiful. This time I'm using it though, where it really is a decorative stitch that looks just like a little bit like a heavier blanket stitch. Isn't that a pretty stitch? I know with this wonderful close-up camera you're enjoying getting to see the whole thing there. And therefore, once again, with my sewing machine and these wonderful stitches on today's sewing machines, I have been able to take a technique off of one of my precious little antique garments and bring it to you where it could be done a lot more easily and a lot simpler. Now then, I have a really, really fantastic craft for you. I have a very, very special guest with me today my daughter, Joanna Pullen Hammett. And I might add that I'm so thrilled. Joanna has just graduated in fashion promotion from Texas Christian University and has joined me in my business. Joanna, welcome to the show. Why, thank you. What do you have for us today? I have a neat little needle pouch where you can keep your needles in. It might only look like a little pouch you put things in, but watch this. You open it up, it's a secret. <laughs> You take, you can undo your pouch like this, open it up, and stick your needles in there, like so. Isn't that handy? You know what? Because I'm always losing my needles. Oh, me that too. is really, it really that is. is really nice. A lot better than just the plastic case that it comes in. That's right. <laughs> now I'm going to show you exactly how to make this needle pouch. First, you take your two pieces of fabric and you put them right sides together, just like that, and you pin it. Next, you're going to sew from the center of the fabric to the end on all four sides. You, first, well, you, mark your, your, you mark your boxes and you sew from the center to the end. Next, you take your sewn fabric, this one, and you turn it inside out just like this. But you got to make sure your raw edges are together. Make sure your raw edges just like that. Then, once your raw edges are together, you're going to simply zigzag around the edges and make room for your cases, just like that. You're going to draw your cases on. Once your, your zigzag, your fabric is zigzag, you're going to pull it and make gathers. Next, you got to make your needle case. So, you take, you make, first you make a little, a pocket, then you have a piece of cardboard. You slip the cardboard in there and that protects your needles. You make two of these, I might add. Then you get a piece of felt, you fold it over, and you put your felt in with your sandwich, just 
just like that. So you make a sandwich. And then you're going to whip the edges of the sandwich together. You then take your sandwich and take your raw, your fabric with the gathers and gather them together like this. Then your final piece will be your pouch. Wasn't that fun? You know what? That was fun and easy. And it I is. Let me tell you one more thing that's okay, neat. Okay. If you just love ribbon like I do, I would use, you can use ribbon instead of fabric. All you do is bud your ribbon together and that is your fabric, just like that. Just zigzagging So you together. can make it as fancy as you want to. If you just don't want a plain one, you can make a beautiful one. And the ribbon one looks just like this. You know what? That would be fun to Isn't make and hang for Christmas tree ornaments, oh, of course. too. And there'd be a little surprise. It Joanna, is. thank you so much for thank sharing you. that adorable needle pouch. And now I'd like to invite you to come to my attic with me. Sometimes I buy an antique garment that is so completely torn up and dirty and, and shredded and rotten that nobody in the world would want it but me. But I want to show you, by the way, this garment was one that was in that condition. But I'd like to show you what we were able to do with this dress in order to get it back in perfectly beautiful condition so I could share the magnificent embroidery with you. The dress is probably 1880s, and the reason I know that is because of the scoop neck and the little short sleeves. By the way, every bit of the embroidery on this dress is completely by hand. Let me show you. Do you see these little spaces in there? By the way, there is netting behind there. All of these pieces were just hanging in shreds. They were horrible. They were rotten. The dress, the top was not even in one piece. You can see there we couldn't even put the whole thing together. Let me turn over here and let you see under the arms. It was completely ripped rotten in shreds and I can even slip my hand under there. We had to do that a little bit by hand. But now then we have netting behind the whole bodice. But this is what I really wanted to buy the dress for and what I really wanted to show you. Look at this embroidery. People, this is every bit by hand. I just think that's some of the most beautiful embroidery I have ever seen in my life. It's a very, very long christening dress which is so typical of the dresses of the 1860 to 1880 era. Absolutely magnificent embroidery. Let me turn it around to the back and show you what we've done so you can see how we repaired this dress. By the way, the christening dresses that tie right here and tie right here to close it, that means they're really very old. You would never find anything after 1900 being made like this. Let's look at this repair again. This was rotten. I'm talking, well, part of it, we, didn't even have, we couldn't even pull it together. But we put the netting behind it, zigzagged it, made a new lining, and over here there's a little piece that was torn that we didn't even try to repair because it was okay. It really was that there were no stress points there. So you see, you can take a piece that is completely rotten, and if you really love it, it can be repaired. For our Sewing from the Heart for today, I'd like to share with you a letter I received from Mary Dell Talander from the Biscayne chapter of the Embroiderers Guild of America in Miami, Florida. She writes, For the past year and a half, the Biscayne chapter of the Embroiderers Guild of America Incorporated has been stitching the Habitat for Humanity logo into a sampler which includes the family's name, the date, and a stitcher's license of Home Sweet Habitat. The sampler is in stretched, mounted, framed, and delivered to the Greater Miami Habitat for Humanity office. This sampler is given to the family on the day their home is dedicated. We know this endeavor helps to personalize and strengthen the community commitment that Habitat emulates. And that was from Mary Dell Talander of the Embroiderers Guild of America, Biscayne Chapter in Miami, Florida. Mary Dell, thank you so much for writing about what you and the other embroiderers in Miami are doing to make such a wonderful program, such as the Habitat for Humanity, even more exciting and even more personal for the people that are so fortunate as to get to have a home at a reasonable price. I would like to thank all of you for coming to be with me in my sewing room today. I've had so much fun, and I hope you have. I'd also like to invite you to join me next time.